great privilege for me to also introduce our first speaker for today. I think for most of us, he needs no introduction. Um, it's Alan Platt. He's the founder of Doxa Dayo Churches, which currently serves 30,000 people across South Africa, the United Kingdom, Germany, and New Zealand. He's also the leader of the City Changers Movement and lead architect of the Church United Program in South Florida. He teaches, speaks, and writes on city transformation, church strategy and unity, and practical theology. So Alan and his wife, Liana, have two children, and they all reside currently in Florida, USA. So Alan, it's a great privilege to host you, you today on this platform. We can't wait to hear what you've got on your heart to share with us on the insights on generosity. So um, over to you, Alan. Uh, a joy, real joy to be with you. Um, I know today is officially day 21 on the lockdown spectrum. Uh, and the only reason why I know that is because I started a Facebook a moment, 10 minutes every day to share on Facebook uh, to help the South African constituency through their uh, lockdown period. And then they extended it and I actually used the alphabet thinking, well, I have enough letters to work through every day. I chose a letter and now <laughs> I've suddenly run out of letters. Uh, so I have to be pretty creative because of the extension, but really our hearts are with you. Um, knowing that it's, it's not been easy, but as, uh, it has already been shared, I'm sure you've taken some very positive elements from it. Uh, today, speaking about generosity, uh, would you take a moment and just consider in your own world, who is the most generous person you know? That's, that's close to you, that, that you, you've recognized generosity in their lives. It could be a family member, it could be a friend, it could be a colleague. Who's the most generous person you know? And then perhaps who's the stingiest person you know? Who's the most self-centered individual that you know that would never share anything? And then uh, if you give some time to this exercise, uh, who do you like the most? <laughs> the generous person or the stingy person? Of course you like the generous one, right? And so, um, there are models and people in our lives that we are grateful for that we recognize have influenced our lives with modeling generosity. Obviously, there is nobody else in the world that we could rather look at than Jesus himself, uh, where his life was the model of generosity. Uh, it was the model of living beyond himself, of giving, of sharing, of laying down his own life. And it was amazing when Jesus speaks to the Samaritan woman, Jesus is actually reminding her of this being the nature of God, because he says to her, if you knew who I am and the generosity of God, uh, it's just so beautiful that Jesus speaks to this woman and says, these are the two things. If you understand these two things in your life, who I am and that God is a generous God, it will reposition your life. Um, but when I look at the life of Jesus, Jesus often spoke on giving and sharing and our whole attitude towards stuff. Uh, and the things of this world, I mean, over and over, it was one of the primary topics that Jesus would address in his engagement. And I, I submit to you today that Jesus made a very clear distinction between two groups of people. Uh, there were givers and there were takers. And in essence, those are the two groups of people in the world. There are people that are primarily takers or they are primarily givers. And Jesus used different ways to explain these two groups to us. 
uh, Jesus, when he speaks about takers, references two kinds of takers. The first one is wolves. He said, beware of the wolves. Wolves are uh, people that have this insatiable desire to have more. They are, they are driven. They are materialistic. They cannot get enough. They, they, they will get it at any expense. Their life motto is, what's yours is mine, and I'm going to take it. That's a wolf. But Jesus also spoke about goats. And uh, he said, you know, uh, goats, you know, often pride themselves that they are not wolves, but they uh, are inherently selfish people. Their life motto is, what's mine is mine, and I'm going to keep it. So they're not necessarily, you know, striving to accumulate more, but what they have, they're holding on so tight. And you will remember that Jesus, in his communication, made a clear distinction between goats and sheep. He said, you know, there will be a division. And, and, and then he gives definition to why he calls them goats and why he calls them sheep. And he says, because they, they were the, the ones that didn't give, didn't go, didn't engage. But these sheep were the ones that visited me in, in prison. These were the ones that served me when I was hungry. These were the ones. He made a very clear distinction as to why they were goats and why they were sheep. And, and when Jesus speaks about sheep, he commends them because they are givers. Um, but I'd like to make a further distinction between sheep and, and, and lamb, saying that sheep, they're the people that say, what's mine, I, I have earned, and with God's help, I will steward it well. I, I will share it. I will navigate it responsibly. But then you get lambs, and uh, lambs are all in. Lambs are the ones that say, what's mine is God's, and I'm going to share it. Um, I, uh, lambs are people that recognize that, that God is the author of everything and that he's my father and that I live from this recognition that God is with me and that I can be generous, um, that my mentality can be generous, that I can think from an abundance mentality and not from a scarcity mentality. Because I know that God, the author of all, is my Father, and He is with me. Um, later, when the disciples reflect on this way of living, they quote Jesus. And in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, uh, this statement is made, Remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, that He said, It's more blessed to give than to receive. I want to take you to a portion of scripture where, in essence, Jesus is not using the words wolves, goats, sheep, uh, sheep and lamb, but, but he's, he's giving us an insight into the attitude that drives these different engagements. And it's the story um, that is uh, in the English Bible now being titled The Parable of the Rich Fool. And here in Luke 12, verse 13, um, we start the story where one of the crowd says to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And he said to him, Man, who has made me a judge or an arbitrator of, uh, over you? And he said to them, Take heed and be, beware of covetousness. In other words, a wolf attitude. For one's life does not consist of the abundance of the things he possesses. A goat attitude. You, the sum total of your life is not about what you have. Jesus is trying to say to them, I want you to 
elevate your thinking, come into a new space where your, your life is not defined by your stuff. That's the world we live in, right? That's the context in which we live in. We think it's a very modern frame of reference, but it was the same in Jesus' time where people actually thought stuff defines their life. Now, this story, perhaps just to give it good context, in ancient times, the firstborn was guaranteed a double portion of family inheritance. And more than likely, this brother uh, who was addressing Jesus was not the firstborn. And he's asking for an equal share. And he's asking that Jesus engages in their conversation as a family to help them to split this evenly. But Jesus decides not to arbitrate into this dispute and goes right to the heart of the issue and he calls it covetousness. Um, and everybody within earshot now heard that Jesus was saying, life is much more than the abundance of your possessions. I learned this very early on in my own journey as a young pastor uh, years ago in Kempton Park. When I just started out in the ministry, and I quickly want to tell you this story, uh, a very wealthy businessman in our church, a great guy, he asked me one day, when I swing by to his office, he had a few things on his heart that he wanted to share with me. I went there, and of course, as I arrived, you could see the success of the business, just the kind of cars that are parked there. And then as you enter into the reception area, you feel... You know, just kind of the, the weight of success and, and affluence. And, of course, when you enter into the office of this man, it's one of those offices where you take a little time just to survey and you smell the leather and you feel, you know, this is, this is you know, somebody that has made it. And as I sat down, this man started unpacking his life. And to cut a long story short, he was, he was putting on the table just, his sense of unfulfillment, his sense of disillusionment and, and the fact that he was so disappointed in so many levels of his life, be it his marriage and his kids and his colleagues and, 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 and just what he, was, what he was hoping to achieve. And I was sitting there thinking to myself as a young person, how could this possibly be this guy seems from the outside looking in as if he has everything that everybody would want and somehow feeling totally unfulfilled. Of course, I ministered to him, got in the car, but I was mulling this in my mind. And I picked up Liana because we were on our way to go and visit an elderly lady who was staying in an apartment building who had an accident. The, it was an older apartment building kind of flats in, in Kempton Park and the uh, lift hadn't come up flush with the floor. She had misstepped, misjudged, fell badly, bruised herself, broke her collarbone, and she was really in bad shape. And we were just going to go and encourage her and bless her. And as we arrived there, I mean, this black and blue face with arm in a sling, she opened up this apartment, this flat um, to us. And as I walked into the flat, I, I looked around and realized she doesn't have much. Um, there's not much that the kids are going to fight about. And of course, as we sat down, I, I said to her, you know, are you okay? How are you? And, and the next moment with this black and blue face, she looked at me and she said, I have so much to be grateful for. And for the next 20 odd minutes, there was this gushing fountain from this elderly lady who, really was a sight. I mean, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And, and she didn't have much to be excited about in terms of stuff. But somehow there was the sense of gratitude and fulfillment and engagement from her life. And I realized I have just been exposed to a giver. And I've just come from a taker. And, and, and suddenly it dawned on me that that life was not about the stuff that we accumulate. 
And I realize, and I'm not saying that all rich people, you know, are upset and unfulfilled. I, I've had times where I've had a little more than I have uh, at other times, and more is always better for me. But there's something about recogni recognizing how do you approach life? Do, are you approaching life as a taker? Or are you approaching life as a giver? And I recognize how how this statement becomes true. Contentment makes a poor man rich and discontentment makes a rich man poor. Here's the principle. If you're not happy when you have little, you'll never be happy when you have much. And Jesus wants us to understand this. So he continues in this portion of scripture and he shares a parable. He says that uh, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? And he said, I'll pull down my barns and I'll build greater. And there I will store my crops and my goods. A real goat mentality. I'll keep what I have. And I will say to my soul, you have so many goods laid up for so many years. Take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, fool. Folks, the day God calls you a fool, you're in trouble. Uh, it's like, you know, um, that scripture that says, and God laughed. When God laughs, it's not a joke. Um, it's serious stuff, fool. He says, this night your soul will be required from you and Whose will those things be which you have provided? And then he makes this big statement. And this is the big, big, big statement that I, I want you to hear. He says, so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, God doesn't mind that we have stuff. God does mind if we're not rich towards him. And how do we become rich towards God? Well, we become generous. Because if you've done it to the least of them, Jesus says, you have done it toward me. You see, here's the principle. The principle is we start to live out the Christ life by sharing what we have. Let me tell you this story. There was a father that wanted to bond with his son and uh, wanted to spend some father-son time. And so he took his son out for an outing, asked him where he wanted to go. And of course, the uh, son uh, had one place and that was McDonald's. And so they went to McDonald's and there they sat and asked the son, what do you want? And the son wanted fries. He wanted these chips. And so the dad decided he's going to get him a big portion of fries of chips and there they sat the dad said he wasn't really hungry so he didn't get anything for himself and there they sat and um the, the dad was wanting to connect with his son but you know what those those chips do to you right you catch the the the, the whiff of those chips and suddenly they they have an appeal on your life and uh, that's what happened to this dad and so as he was smelling these chips he thought man he'll just have one or two of them and he reached out to take one of those chips. And as he was reaching out, the son saw the hand coming and he pulled away the plate and said, hey, it's mine. And the dad thought for a moment, why did his son just do what he did? And as he was reflecting on this, he thought to himself, you know, what my son doesn't realize is that I and the source of the chips, <laughs> the origin. <laughs> I'm, I'm the one that provided these chips to my son. And, and it wasn't that I wanted chips, it was more that I wanted an attitude that my son would share this with me. And as he was reflecting on this, he thought, you know, if, if the chips were, were done, I would have gone and ordered more chips if my son wanted more chips. And if I, if I really wanted chips, I could have gone and ordered my own chips, he said, he said. He said, and as he was reflecting on this, he thought, man, he had so much money with him that he could have arranged with the kitchen to come and cover his son with chips. The issue was not the chips. The issue was 
the attitude behind the chips. The sense that you recognize God is your source. God is the origin of all reality in our lives. And that we, we, as Christ followers, get to reveal the very character of God. We get to demonstrate the very nature of God as we become people who live generous lives in every dimension of our lives. Let me wrap this up by saying Paul challenges this in relationships when he says, and the message translation says it so well in Ephesians 5.25, he says, husbands go out all out in love for your wives, exactly as Christ did it for the church. Listen to this. A love marked by giving, not getting. Givers, not takers. We are reminded in Corinthians 8 that we are to become progressively acquainted and recognize more strongly the Amplified says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his kindness, his generous gracious generosities, undeserved favor and spiritual blessing. So uh, uh, that through he, the fact that he was rich, for our sakes he became poor in order that by his poverty you might become enriched, abundantly supplied in every dimension of your life. May God give you grace as, as you grapple with this concept of generosity to ask yourself this question, am I primarily a giver or am I a taker? And how can I transition and how can I grow even to go beyond just being a sheep to becoming a lamb? God bless you and I thank you for your time.